started Make Life Fun podcast because I needed more fun in my life. When I became a mother, I, for some reason, just put on this like high ponytail, mom jeans, and nose to the ground. I wasn't having fun. It wasn't until I started having fun that it started becoming easy. Fun and mental health go hand in hand for me. I've been in this mental health game my whole life. <laughs> and I am so lit up to like help other people. I'm so lit up for other people to experience this because it's what my wish and my mission is for every woman is to find safety within themselves because it took me a long time to get here. Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of the Make Life Fun Show. Today we have Tasha Skillen. She is a burnt out perfectionist and procrastination coach. After being diagnosed with a chronic disease that affected her quality of life, she set upon a journey to find her truest and happiest self. She has overcome so many obstacles to become her best self and today she will help us do the same. Tasha, thank you so much for being here. So I am super fascinated by the fact that you're a coach on procrastination and burnout. And I am a, I'm calling myself like a people pleaser in recovery because it's a practice Mm -hmm. (laughs) of learning those boundaries. It's a practice of learning to love who I am in my skin so that I can Mm -hmm. show up as who I am. And that's been a practice that has not come easy. And so I would love to hear about you. Tell us your work, what you do. And yeah, let's get this conversation started. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm excited. And the reason that I am a procrastination and burnout recovery coach is very similar to what you just said. I am in a lifelong journey (laughs) of perfectionism recovery, which includes people pleasing and procrastination and hyper productivity for me in particular. That was my like strongest leg of perfectionism. And it landed me in bed. I was in bed for two years, having lost both my businesses. My kids were eight and five. I couldn't do anything with them. I saw them sometimes maybe for an hour a day because I was so ill. And I was told that I was not going to get better. And I'd be lucky if I didn't get worse. And I was like, I, I was, I was 37 when I got that specific diagnosis. I had been sick for about three years before that. And I was like, I, that this can't be all I'm going to do in my life. Being a hyper product productive person and being someone who is driven and has always been really ambitious. I have accomplished a lot, but I still mm-hmm. had a lot more that I wanted to do. And a lot of purpose that I had felt like mm-hmm. had not been fulfilled. And as I started digging into what it really meant to have this diagnosis and really all of the reasons I ended up in that position were mm-hmm. because of the rules I was following from the outside world, all these expectations I was trying to meet all these obligations I was trying to fulfill. I was like, Oh, well, everybody I know, every woman I know in particular is living this life. Mm. And then looking at the multiple layers of, you know, people who are differently abled, people who are or w- women of color, people who have English as a second language, like all of these different factors in our society that that society, the structure mm-hmm. put in place to make it harder and harder and harder for anybody to have autonomy, their own decision-making, because we were all operating from scarcity. We were all mm-hmm. trying to just survive. I was like, when I get better, when I get to a point where I can help people, I am going to help every woman I know never lose the time that I lost. I'll never get those two years back with my kids. I'll never get those two years back in my purpose. And so that's what my life's work has been about. And like you said, it's a journey. I'm in year eight of this recovery process and I am still uncovering stuff going, oh man, (laughs) I have to do this now. I have to figure this part out now. I have to heal this now. I didn't know there's that much there. So yeah, that's, that's what I do. I, we do this through a a membership program. We have one-on-one private coaching. We have courses and all of these things to help people meet them where they are. Mm -hmm. Usually our, our community is overwhelmed because they're trying to do so many things. Mm -hmm. And then the podcast that I have is geared towards helping support women in particular week after week of reminding them of the power of boldly becoming you, how important it is to keep doing that work and showing up for that part of the day-to-day life. Is that the name of the podcast boldly becoming? boldly becoming you. And that spoke straight to my heart because I am not only black, African-American, I, English is my second language and I'm the oldest. (laughs) So the doing, doing, doing part is like, I wasn't living. I wasn't doing enough unless I felt that burnout, unless I was like, I went to bed and I was just like exhausted. And so that spoke like directly to my heart of the fact that we're just programmed to just go, go, go. And what I found is when I was operating from that place, I wasn't really doing anything. (laughs) 
<laughs> I wasn't doing much because you're just staying busy. Well, and you also, at the end of the day, never give yourself credit for what you actually did do. Mm-hmm. Oh, at the end of the day, you're thinking, oh, I should have been doing this. I didn't get this done. It, it wasn't a good day because I didn't get this mm-hmm. list done. Math doesn't add up to <laughs> being it being possible because if you actually wrote down how long it would take to do all the things on a, on a, on a to-do list, it's physically impossible, yet we are holding ourselves to these standards because of the feedback we have received from the outside mm. world of how we're allowed to show up, what parts of ourselves we're allowed to be. And, you know, after decades of that, plus unaddressed trauma from when I was a kid, it just, it ended up biting me in the butt. And my body was like, we've been trying to tell you for 10 years mm. to take it slower, to dial it down. And you're not, I'm so hard headed. I'm so stubborn. My body was like, and we're shutting this whole thing down. Mm. And that, that was the only way I was going to learn what I have now learned in these last seven years is my body constantly saying, you are going to listen, even if you think you're not going to right now. Our body knows yes. it holds on to all of it. And that is where my work started was I was disconnected from my body. Mm-hmm. And so learning to even feel safe here, learning to even know what that connection felt like, like that was where it started for me too. Yeah. And I was just like, wow, there's a different way of being. And so everything you're saying just speaks straight to me because until I did this work there, I would have burnt out. I would have, mm-hmm. that yep. would have been me if I didn't slow down. So what do you tell these women or do you work with men as well? A few good men. My <laughs> husband and I are in business together. <laughs> and the reason that we are doing this together is because without him, honestly, supporting me through all of that, the, the, the hyper productivity and the, the burnout and the recovery. Um, and then he ended up burning out from caregiver syndrome because he was taking care of me and all of our, all of our finances and both mm. of our small children. Right. So we do this together because he has such a different experience that is still so relatable to so many women because he ended up having to be a caregiver and he has always been a, a nurturer. And so I, I listened to some of the episode from you sharing about you and, and your partner and it sounded like a very similar relationship dynamic. Like we, we were taken care of for me. It was really the first time I was taken care of the way I needed to be taken care of. So for the two of us, I had to learn to be a caregiver because how I was modeled, it was not as effective as I wanted to be. And so he and I have worked together and we've, we've joined this healing journey together. We have our own individual lives to heal and also as a couple and as a family. And so we do this together, but yes, we mostly work with women because honestly, the world is built for men. And so we are trying to help the women understand one of the things that I've only recently last year or so really dug into is that I spent 15 years working on personal development and reading all the self-help books and self-improvement books. And what I learned in my reflection of that is if not all, almost all of them were cis hetero, able-bodied white Christian, wealthy men who displayed a extreme independence posturing, but had a team of dozens, often women Mm -hmm. behind that end result that we saw on stages and, you know, having books and whatnot. And so when I started thinking about how often I felt limited to do the things that were going to make me successful because of my cycle, because of how my hormones fluctuated, and then how my body has struggled after both pregnancies, I was like, this does not make any sense. And so our focus is to really help women move away from these strategies and these methodologies of success and money and success and health and success and productivity that were never going to work for us. They're never going to work for us. Every woman who ever spends their lifetime doing that ends up sick. And so we help them get back into trusting who they are, rebuilding the trust with their, their body and rebuilding the trust with their inner wisdom and creating their own systems and methodologies for being productive based on what they need and what they want and what they want, what their core values are and those kinds of things, Absolutely. which is just mind blowing for so many because we were not taught that we were not taught that. And it's the most powerful thing. When I made that shift that it can be fun, like it can be fun. It can be inspired. (laughs) Like it can feel good. Like I can say enough is enough and like close the laptop and walk outside. Like I can do that. I have that power. I have that control and I don't have to have that permission from anybody else. But for years, I did not know that. Right. For years, I was operating in the opposite way, the Mm -hmm. opposite way of just going. And so I love that you're teaching women that you get to create your destiny. Basically, you get to create what you desire. 
in a well, way that feels good. Yes. That's authentic to you. Not mm-hmm. what I think it should be good for you. Right. And this is one of the things we really work on is removing this good, bad, right, wrong filter. And is it, is it effective? Is the thing that you have been forcing yourself to try to do habits and routines, is it effective for you? Or are you, are you just doing it because you read in a book or you've heard, <laughs> you know, people talking about, this is what you should do. And most of the time, like myself for so long, I'm like, well, this is what they said. Well, they being who, <laughs> who, <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, you think about, it, I know you have a little one, right? How old is mm-hmm. yours? He's seven months. Could be seven months. Oh, oh gosh. Going to be eight months soon. That's so crazy. tiny still. Yeah. So yeah. You know, as you'll see, and I know, I'm sure you know this already, but the next couple of years, he is not going to be giving a rat's butt about your feedback. Like he doesn't care what you think he is all about what do I need? What do I want? Explore. We were all that way. And then we started learning how that we needed to obey, that we needed to look outside ourselves for how to make decisions. The approval and the disapproval helped us or, you know, hindered us and, and taught us what parts of ourselves to hide. And so the journey is not about improving yourself or fixing yourself. It's getting back down to mm. who you really are underneath of all the stuff that you've acquired over your lifetime of rules and, and things you're supposed to follow. So it's this like peeling back layers of onions and, you know, layers of this onion and, and then realizing, oh, there's another layer. Oh, there's another layer and there's another layer. And eventually getting closer to the center of who you are. And your inner voice becomes the louder voice. And that's mm. where that catalyst of change, like, oh, that's magic. what I sound like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, that's where magic happens. Mm-hmm. That's where life just changes like drastically, but it does take that consistency. It does take always looking for it, but th- not in the way of wanting to fix it, but in the way of wanting to feel better, mm-hmm. like listening to those feelings that, and they have answers. I think I call them their gifts. I say feelings have your feelings are gifts to you, like unopen them and acknowledge them and allow them like their gifts. And for the longest time for me personally, I thought you have to be strong. You have to be happy. So plastered on that fake it till you make it sign. It was so ingrained in my head that I was a walking robot for fake it till you make it. And I know that I can't be the only one. We're taught toxic positivity. Because women, women of color, especially are not allowed to be angry. You can't be frustrated. You can't be woman. Yeah. Oh God. Can't have that. Mm -hmm. And so there's so much of that conditioning that we all have internalized, even when it's about us. I mean, the misogynistic trainings that I used to do for my team, I look back and I'm like, I cannot believe I was perpetuating something that I'm now recovering from. And it's a rough road to realize that Mm. (laughs) that is in you, not just out there as well. But it's so it's important work because especially, and I'm sure you're experiencing this as well, when you, it's especially, I think it's easier for people who have children to start realizing some of these things because Mm -hmm. you start seeing things reflected back in you. And you also start seeing, oh, why am I doing this thing? This is not what I want my kid to experience. And it becomes a mutually beneficial healing journey for Mm -hmm. both me and my husband and our two kids it's been very rewarding to see that they're going to be having a set of tools that I didn't have access to. And I get so frustrated when they obey me as opposed to telling me. <laughs> Questioning. You, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so the, the practice in our house is now answering three questions every day, asking ourselves, what do I want? Mm. What do I need? And then who do I need to become? What version of myself do I need to become to have the life that I crave? I and those. just allowing those questions to be the guidance every single day helps counterbalance all of the mess that we have received from the outside world. I love that. So when do you do that practice? Is it kind of like dinner time or is it just everybody individually working on it? I just love that so much. So I do mine first thing in the morning Mm -hmm. before I even get out of bed. I have, I have had to incorporate the practice of not getting out of bed to answer the questions internally first, because there are so much that I could be distracted by once I get out of bed. The moment your foot hits the ground. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And our kids are 15 and almost 12. And so we have helped them over the last couple of years learn to create a daily log practice for themselves. And so Mm -hmm. whether they're writing on the actual log or typing it, actually they type, they type it, or it's something that they are conscious of. It's an expectation that we have of the people in this, in this family that we are asking that question. And what is your intention is basically Mm -hmm. what those three questions boil down to. 
And we do check-ins and, you know, all of us are human. We have intentions and there'll be a couple of days or sometimes a couple of weeks where that is not the forefront of our mind, but that's to be expected. The expectation is not that you do it perfectly, but that you circle back to this practice as soon as you realize you've taken a detour because Mm -hmm. you have to be allowed to take detours. That's how you explore things and discover things. Like you said, emotions, we take these detours. Oftentimes you will discover some things that you need to have some emotional processing mm-hmm. with. And so all of it is embraced as long as we keep coming back to yeah. the internal wisdom. Yep. The more you do it, I say, we're always practicing something. So the question mm-hmm. is, what is it that you're practicing? What exactly. is it that you're trying and learning to embody? And I just love that practice so much. I'm just going to have to adopt that. I think <laughs> I you're love that, to. especially for the family, because i am gone through this journey. Like, I love that you brought this up because I've gone through this journey of complete change, complete transformation. I keep envisioning like the butterfly, the caterpillar cocoon. And now I have this wisdom and this, like this knowing that I just didn't have before. And this overflow of love that I feel like I just want to give away that mm-hmm. I didn't have before because I, I didn't have it for myself first. Right. And so I keep thinking like, how is that going to portray into my family? Like, how is it that I give that to my child? How is it that I'm able to, you know what I mean? Like, Oh yeah. Like it's such a big question. (laughs) It it is. And what's fascinating in the journey that I've been on and as we're helping, you know, all these women embark on this journey as well is that we hear so often that you can't love someone unless you love yourself first, but what actually is true is you can't love someone or love yourself without someone loving you. We have this expectation in our society of this super extreme independence, and that's Mm -hmm. how you do everything. And that's Mm -hmm. how you can be the ultimate ideal success, whatever that is. But the reality is we are built to be relational. We are, I I consider myself a relationship activist because we, we have to lean into co-creating healing experiences together. It's not possible to do it on your own because you do need feedback from out from the outside world. The difference is, and this is what gets watered down is that we need to be intentional about who we allow the feedback and and how we weigh that those, those people need to meet eligibility requirements before (laughs) you receive their feedback and do something about it. That changes the course of your decision-making or, or, or allow something into your heart. I don't know about you, but I was not taught how to make decisions for Mm -hmm. myself. And so it's a, it's a learning process process for most of us, but the healing part can be kind of overwhelming when you are trying to learn all these new things about yourself that you all of a sudden covered. Like, what do I do with all this, all these parts and pieces that I didn't know were there? Yeah. You bury them, you bury them Mm -hmm. so deep. And I just, I don't want my child to suffer the way that I suffered, but I also want him to be who he's going to be. So it's like the thought of like, of like making this little person, (laughs) love himself from the beginning it's like how do you even I know they model what you do and it's like they you don't even have to say a word they feel it before we like that's what I'm learning anyway like he sometimes knows my emotion better than I do I'm like you're acting crazy and then I'll be like I'm acting a little like I feel a little crazy (laughs) yes and it's pretty magical you know as they get older and they start to learn more about themselves and it's such a beautiful gift that you're giving him because I didn't take, do the, start doing this work until my kids were well after the zero to seven years, mm-hmm. which is really such a formative time where they are understanding themselves and it says, lays that groundwork, honestly, in their nervous system. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of what you and I are experiencing at this, these ages now is based on what we experienced as in our nervous system development when mm-hmm. we were little. And so to be able to give that gift to him, that you're aware of that that imprint that you're having on him and everything around him is having an imprint on him that you're going to be able to help him be curious about who he is, as opposed to trying to mold who he is, which is something I wish I had known earlier on (laughs) because my kids wouldn't have to do the healing work that they are having to do right now. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. That really, yeah, that really resonates. I've been on this healing journey. I feel like for all my life, (laughs) I feel like I've been unlearning. I've always known there's a better way. I've always, I didn't know what it was, but I've always known there has to be, there has to be a better way that you have to be able to feel better than this. Right. (laughs) And so like you, there has to be. And so it took a while to finally figure it out, but I think the catalyst was having him Mm -hmm. like, that was the big shift for me. That was like the biggest shift. It was like, this person is, this little person is here and I'm responsible for being his guardian 
because I think that's all I am. That's mm-hmm. the way I look at my responsibility is to be his guardian, to be the person that he's supposed to be. Before that, I like, I just, it just is so different now. Do you find that you are less tolerant of other stuff that you used to be more tolerant of before he was here? That was a big change for me too. Huge. My boundaries, like I didn't know I had these strong boundaries. (laughs) And that protectiveness comes out and it's so, I think for a lot of us, especially as women, I know I felt during my pregnancies, not fragile, but definitely protective of my Mm. body because they were, you know, they were inside, but I didn't know I had it in me until they came out to be like, I will shut the whole thing down. If you even consider trying to imprint anything on these, ch- on these children, that is not love and nurture. And I did not expect that. Like people always tell you life mm-hmm. is never going to be the same. And you're like, yeah, I hear it over and over <laughs> and over again, yeah. but I didn't yeah. expect myself to be so enormous in my protectiveness. And it's been a gift because it, then it, it has helped me in my journey now of the inner healing, the, the inner child healing work that I'm doing to bring what I have given to my two kids to my inner child and know what that can feel like and what it can look like when I'm myself now. Mm-hmm. And it's, that's a weird journey. <laughs> it is. It literally, sometimes I have no words. Like, I'm just like, this is just crazy what is happening for me as I'm like walking into this role and living in this role and being in this role as a mom. And literally my boundaries went up the moment that belly, like the moment I felt any sort of anything in my belly, like the moment that I had the conscious knowing that I was pregnant and I could like, it wasn't just the, you're told you're pregnant. You don't feel anything yet. Yeah. I was just like, so protective. I was like my emotions, like my husband, I was like, I can't, I can't deal with this. I was so my own cheerleader. I was so able to like stand up for myself. And it's like this little guy who's in my belly, who's not even out in this world yet is giving me this much power that I've always had. Mm -hmm. We all have, whether we have a baby or not, whether we're pregnant or not. And that led me to start looking for it and searching. Like if this has been here all along, how much bigger is it? (laughs) Yes. I love that. And and that's that co-creation experience that people don't take into consideration. We think about collaborative work, being professional and in a partnership for, for a marriage or a long-term commitment, those kinds of romantic relationships, but it's everywhere. This mm-hmm. healing that you are doing is, it's not like your son's aware that he's part of this process, <laughs> but you do, you did need him to help mm-hmm. you in this journey and, and understanding how many places we're actually experiencing this co-creation can really help us open the door for those of us like myself who were, I'm also the oldest of mm-hmm. three, I have three younger siblings that are a lot younger than me. So I am very much the oldest. I was mm-hmm. parentified as a kid. And so I was kind of a loner in a lot of places. Mm-hmm. And then I just took that to the extreme because I was operating from this kind of safety security place, or that's the only way I felt safe. And it's been a lot of work to break that wall down and feel safe and secure in my day-to-day experiences and my body and, and in, in these relationships that are challenging me, but in a loving way mm-hmm. and allowing that to be part of the healing journey as well. It's, it's a lot of work. It's, it's work, but it's, I feel like the best work we could ever do for everybody, mm-hmm. <laughs> for the yeah. whole world. Like we heal and we have that capacity to hold space for others to do the same, which is what you're doing. I just think it's beautiful, beautiful work that you are doing because it's needed. Mm-hmm. And like everything you're saying is so resonating with me because we have, I didn't know we had all this in common, but we have so much in common. And I could feel you like speak to my soul when you're saying how you were feeling during these moments. And so for moms that are listening to this, that are feeling this way, feeling this heaviness, They haven't made it quite yet to where the life they desire to create. And they're still not feeling that power that we're talking about. They're feeling that overwhelm. They're feeling that procrastination, which I say our feelings, our emotions are protecting us and they're, it's worth investigating. So what would you say to that mama? So I love that you brought up the butterfly example earlier, the caterpillar to the butterfly, Mm -hmm. because one of the things often left out in like media representation of that is that the moment it's not like the caterpillar is a caterpillar. And then 10 seconds later, there's a butterfly, <laughs> right? There's this really ooey, gross goo of a mess that is a long period of time comparatively mm-hmm. to the lifespan of a caterpillar to the end of the life of a butterfly. And that goo is where you are. If you're in this place where you are, you're aware of that. There's gotta be something else 
that feeling of feeling overwhelmed and you're starting to really see so many things that are not aligned with how you want to feel. And you know that you crave change. We have a tendency. I know my, do, I do it. And most of our community has expressed the same to like want to rush into this butterfly because this goo is not a good time. This is this being in the muck is for the birds. I'm not interested, but the muck is where you know, the, the actual process of a chrysalis is that it's not like the caterpillar, it just transforms. It literally breaks down to almost nothing. It's, it's not a caterpillar in the chrysalis. And then it re it picks up the pieces it needs and moves into the other chapter of its life. And in the process of moving out of the goo, the fight is how it's strong enough to actually go. If you were to cut a chrysalis open, even though the butterfly was technically ready, it wouldn't survive because it needs to get stronger in that process. And so when we're in this buck, we feel like we're completely alone in that goo and it's messy and it's overwhelming and it's exhausting. And it's so, there's so much grief in that period when you can acknowledge that, yes, I'm in the goo and I don't have to be here by myself to create space in your life, to welcome in loving, nurturing support is the most important thing you do, because that is the fastest way to move out of the goo and into this place where you can feel transformed. And so if you find yourself in this place, understand that you are not alone. It's just that when the rest of us are in that place, before you got there, we were also quiet mm-hmm. trying to figure out how to get out of the goo. And so there are people who have, who've gotten to the next stage who would be willing and honored to be witness to you re- rebuilding. And oh, we don't always feel like that. Yeah. Is, oh, helping somebody get to that other side. Nothing, nothing feels better mm-hmm. than seeing somebody get to that other side and also holding space for them to have those moments where their eyes are open and transform. I love how you said that gooey, that ickiness in the middle. I call that the messy middle. Mm -hmm. Like that is the messy middle. And sometimes you take that two step forward and you take five steps back and you're just constantly like in this like movement forward and backwards and forwards and backwards. And the whole getting support, the way it was put to me, that was so brilliant that I will never forget is like, if you have something on your face, if you have something in your teeth, unless like, Somebody has to tell you, Yeah. <laughs> somebody has to say there's something on your teeth or else you'd be walking throughout the day with it until you saw yourself in the mirror and saw it. Mm-hmm. So that is the quickest. I love that you said that. that is the quickest way to transformation is getting somebody who's been where you are to where you want to be and giving them permission. Like right. you said earlier, <laughs> find the person who has something that you want to imprint, something that you want to foster, something that you want to create, because so often that we're giving permission to whoever we're giving permission to TV shows. We watch the news, even music, like everything. We're just letting it all come in and words matter. Yep. That words. I mean, <laughs> I'm a nerd when it comes to words. I'm super nerd when it comes to words and how powerful it is. If you don't realize how habitual your word choice mm-hmm. is. And so many of us have very unique, very specific connotations with certain words that we've always grown up with when someone else doesn't have that connotation, but they use it with us. We are miscommunicating in just that one word. And this happens in all partnerships and friendships in romantic partnerships, parent travel. The other part of this that we have really, we'd really dig into is understanding that this path from where you are to that other side, that transformation Mm -hmm. is a healing journey, but it's also a, a journey of developing and acquiring skills and tools and resources that you were never given. And when you realize that the thing that you want is not about you being good enough, it's about really just layering the things you don't have in your toolbox and giving yourself permission to be a full, full human with all the emotions. Mm -hmm. It doesn't feel so mountainous. It doesn't Mm -hmm. feel so overwhelming because it's just, Oh, I just need to layer this and layer this and layer this. And then eventually I'll have all the things I need to be on that other side, Mm -hmm. rather than feeling like I have to do it all right now. It's a layer layering over time, which again is easier when you have other people, when you create your, your intentional village Mm -hmm. around you, that those resources you don't have to have them all. Mm-hmm. They're going to, people around you are going to be saying, oh, I have this podcast or I have this book or I take this course or this coach or whatever. And they'll say, so they're shortening your path. Mm-hmm. You, don't, you don't have to source everything by yourself. Exactly. And all the people in my life, that's what they've been. They've been bridge builders. They've been the ones that lead me to certain different things. And trusting them was what got me to where I am today. Like there is no way like you said, we are better together. We, there's no way we could do the journey on our own. We want belonging. We want to feel in a community we want, but especially right now with the way the world is, it's like the opposite. Yeah, uh, It's the opposite. So I think going and 
seeking help and giving permission to people that you trust and knowing that it's okay to let your messy middle, your gooey parts show. Yes. And the part about that, that I think so many women right now are listening to and cringing saying, but every time I've done that in the past, it's bitten me, right? Like Mm -hmm. we've, we've had those experiences where we tried to be vulnerable and it didn't, it wasn't received well. And so this is a skill set that I wasn't taught. I wasn't taught how to create filters of access to me and my energy and my attention, knowing that, 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 that is out there somewhere can give somebody some hope that there are eligibility requirements. And for me in this most recent chapter of my healing journey, it's been about healing my relationship with receiving. I have to be willing to receive a lot more, a lot deeper than I have been in the past. And that is something so many women are not used to doing. Mm -hmm. You think about anytime you think about anybody that you've given a compliment to, that's a woman. Mm -hmm. The response is usually, oh, I got it on sale. Oh, it's nothing. Like that's a minimizing and a qualifying this whole thing. Yeah. yeah. And it's because we've not learned how to receive without apology. And so that is one of the, the major skill sets that we're working on in 2022 with our community is building this relationship with receiving that's healthy and allows you to receive the abundance that you were, mm. you are born to have access yeah, to, but you have been denying. Mm-hmm. That one's a big one. That's what I've been practicing for, I think the last year and a half, that's been my practice of like, when somebody gives me something, when somebody gives me a compliment, instead of thinking all the ways that I could be like, deflect, 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 all the ways I could just say, thank you. And I could really feel it and really receive it. So what does that practice look like for you? Like for me, it's putting my hand on my heart and saying like, feeling myself receiving it, like literally feel my body, like absorb it. Yes. And that has been like game changer. It is, it definitely has been an embodiment practice for me as well. And at the first, before I could even get to that part, I had to start feeling what was in my body when I was not able to receive, like, what is, where does it show up when I'm like in that deflection mode where like, what part of me is tenses up and like tries to, to hide and like pack battle. And then started working with my nervous system regulation mm-hmm. in that, but then also realizing actually when I was in bed for those couple of years, one of the things I, one of the projects I worked on was a, a book proposal about gratitude and not just the general gratitude practices, but the fact that so many of us hoard our gratitude mm-hmm. that we put it in a journal and we put it in the notes of our phone, or we think about it, but so often we aren't extending that gratitude out to someone who it will make a huge mm-hmm. impact because I could ask you, and I'm sure I can ask any of the listeners right now. Can you remember a time where someone thanked you for something? Of course you can. And it mm-hmm. makes you light up, right? You think about the, the yeah. text you got or the card you got or the message on Facebook that you got that said, hey, this thing you did that you probably don't even remember doing, I still carry that with me. When I receive that kind of accolade, that kind of compliment, that kind of gratitude, I now log that as, oh, I get to carry this with me. This is a gift that I get to take with me for the rest of my life, because I won't ever forget that that was appreciated. Mm -hmm. And now they, by receiving it that way, have seen another example of how they can also receive it that way. And so I take it on as a responsibility now to model what I want for these people that I love and care about so much. Oh, I love that. It definitely, it lights you up when you think of something, of somebody giving you that thank you, that heartfelt thank you of something that you did. And it's almost like we're robbing somebody of that joy when we are like quick to be like, no, don't do that. Like for Thanksgiving, I was this year, I took upon myself to be like the Thanksgiving person. I was going to make the turkey. I was going to go to the grocery store. I wanted to do that for my family because I just moved back to Boise where they live. And I did it with no intention of anybody pitching in, anybody helping. And my brother and sister, they decided to send me money. And normally I would have been so quick to be like, what are you talking about? Like, no, like I did this out of heart, out of kindness. But I took that step back and I was like, no, if they couldn't do this, they wouldn't have. They're doing this from a place of joy. Like take it, Josie, accept it. And that was such a a shift. That's huge. I want to say- Congratulations to you for that. Cause that's big. Those are when money, I mean, we haven't, I, we weren't even talking about money yet, but money for women, there's so much resistance. We have taught, mm. we've been taught so much resistance. So good for you. And you know, that first time we do something like that is so prickly, like we feel mm. inside, but once we realize, like you said, it was coming from a place of joy mm. that it was intended with love and nurturing. Mm-hmm. 
it takes down the permanence of the wall that we had had before. And it's so much easier after that, but man, what a great, what I a even great went story. to write, like, I literally went to write like, what? No, <laughs> like, what are you doing? And I literally had to set my phone down and be like, Take a deep breath here, Josie. <laughs> You're, this is what you've been working on. Now it's time to put it into actual practice. It's time to do what you've been talking about doing. And yeah, I haven't told them the story yet, but I will one of these days <laughs> or they'll hear it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I love that for you. <laughs> or they'll hear it. But yeah, when it comes to receiving us women, there's so much love to receive. There's so much joy to receive. It's a practice, but it's one that's, again, another one that's worth. So worth, worth it worth it like with your kiddos and having fun since we are on the make life fun podcast yeah what do you guys do to have fun and make it light and still have this like connection and you know, foster that I am certainly not the fun officer in our family which is you know another example of how I needed my husband to be my partner in this lifetime mm-hmm. because he brought the fun factor to our family. Mm. And we have taken turns in that role over the years, but I wouldn't have known that it was safe for me to have fun until he showed me what it looked like to be having fun and experience safety and security. So, you know, now we've, we've actually, we unschool our kids. So our kids are home with us all day. And so most of our day is fun. I mean, we, they, they get to explore, decide what they're interested in. And then they, we just facilitate that. So whether it's doing research or going on a field trip or, you know, watching a documentary or watching a bunch of movies, I mean, it's all, all designed to fill you up Mm -hmm. and, you know, our core values and our family are supported by it. And fun is one of them. How can we make whatever this thing is that we need to do fun? And that's one of the questions we ask when we're about to embark on something that's maybe challenging or mm-hmm. something that maybe, you know, there's, there's always gonna be stuff that you have to do. That's not fun. <laughs> How can we make it more fun? So it's, you know, music is a huge factor mm-hmm. for our family. There's, if there is something that's going to be happening, that's not going to be a lot of fun. Music is always the first thing we lean into to elevate the energy mm-hmm. and the vibration of the experience. And when it's weather appropriate, when we can water, so music and water all the time, as much as possible, those elements just shift our moods Mm -hmm. quickly. And so we're looking for ways to, to learn from each other and heal with each other and and try to make it fun. Try to make it fun. Yeah. My journey to fun, especially when I got to motherhood, I was like, cause you hear so often that being a mom is just hard being a mom, you lose yourself you got 18 years and then you can have your life back. And I heard this, but it went in one ear and out the other, but my subconscious heard it loud and clear <laughs> because the moment Everett was born, I put on these like blinders and I was just like, well, this is it until he's 18. We're just going to be mom and this is going to be hard and there's going to be no more fun. But working with my coach, my own personal development, she was like, Josie, when was the last time you went outside? Just that question. Like, when was the last time you went outside? I was like, I haven't gone outside since he got here. <laughs> it's so easy to lose track of when things like that are happening when you have a new baby, but yeah, that's a huge deal. We have rekindled our relationship and our love for nature. We en- ended up manifesting a trip across the country and back mm-hmm. again this summer. And it was a life-changing experience for all four of us. And we were outside more than we were inside, not just by the hours in the car, we were surrounded by the outside, but actual doing things in Utah and Wyoming and, and on the route one on Cal in California. Mm-hmm. And then the desert, I mean, we saw so much nature that we realized, wow, we need as a family and as individuals, so much more connection with nature more frequently, because we had you know, my daughter and I have, uh, this, these chronic conditions, we had barely any symptoms when we were in that experience. Mm. And it just speaks to the nature of nervous system dysregulation and how effective nature can be in that and how much more joyful we all were because of that. Mm. So I'm glad you reminded me that I forgot that that's one of the things that we've, we have re-engaged with this year. Oh, tell me about this manifestation. <laughs> it, it gave me tingles. So I'm just like, Ooh, that's my dream with my son. Yes. It, I mean, it was wild. So in the beginning of the year, I do a vision board workshop, which is not really a vision board. It's a lot of other things, but I haven't figured <laughs> yeah. out what else to call it. 
but it's essentially, you do have visuals of what you want. And so at the beginning of the year, my husband and I, especially after, you know, the majority of the first year of quarantine being stuck at home and us having to be extra careful because of our chronic conditions, we were like, we have got to get out of this house. Like we've got to go somewhere. And so we started thinking about, and I, I my husband lived in Seattle, Washington for several years and lived in Hawaii for a couple of years. And I lived in Phoenix, Arizona, but we're based in the, on the East coast. And so mm-hmm. we're in Maryland, DC, and then Virginia, most of my kids' lives. <clears throat> so we wanted to take the kids and see these different places mm-hmm. that look nothing like where we live. And so we've just started, you know, looking at pictures and there's red rock mountains and there's, you know, beautiful beach and, and those kinds of scenes. And we just put them on there with no attachment about how it was going to happen. And it's a, bizarre series of events, a woman that I have befriended and was co-moderating a Facebook group about the book untamed. I don't know if you've heard of untamed Mm -hmm. by Glenn Doyle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We became really close and she moved her family from Michigan out to California. Six months later, they needed to go back to Michigan for two weeks to see family and do this thing, but they had a dog and she's just in passing in a conversation said, would you want to come out here? And I was like, (laughs) I would want to come out here we are in a transition financially. I'm like, I don't know if we can afford it. She's well, we were going to pay for the dog to be in a kennel anyway, but this would reduce his anxiety significantly. And I talked to my husband and he was like, I don't know. I don't know. I'm like, you know what? I feel it. I feel it in my gut that this is something we need to do. So for the next two months, next two or three months, we planned and we looked at the route and what was the best route. And as a family, we would get together and look at how we were going to make it all happen. We ended up buying a new vehicle so that we could get there. My husband, my son is five eleven, So we needed something to, oh, to, to hold all of us. And ultimately it just ended up working out. Like things just kept falling into place. We have a wall in our kitchen, right next to our kitchen, our, our dinner table mm-hmm. is just picture. It's all of our vision boards. Each of us mm-hmm. have our own vision boards. And there was a map of the U S and it was showing the route that we wanted to take at dinner. We would talk about which stage do you want to go to? What do you want to do when we get there? And so it was we You're were living bringing, as if, yeah. Yes. And so we eventually were packing the car and I'm like, I can't believe this is happening. And we left for four and a half weeks. Oh my gosh. That's so good. I love it that was story. Incredible. <laughs> it was incredible. I mean, the, my husband jokes about how that my kids were over my excitement within like a week because I was like, Oh, I, we took the vision boards with us and I was like, look, it's right here. This exact picture is right here. And I would, we would stop on, on the California coast. It took us like nine hours to drive three and a half hours because I was stopping. Look at this, look at this. And my husband and I, sometimes the kids were not impressed and we're like, fine, stay in the car. And we, I just, that was me That's allowing myself in. to be fully in it and having fun. And it was just an incredible, incredible experience. Savoring every moment. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's such a great story of like how magical we truly are and how if we want it bad enough and we believe it bad enough and we put it out there, like we have to put it out there and yes. voice it. You have to talk <laughs> about it. You have to talk about it. Cause if I hadn't talked about that with my friend, Sarah, she wouldn't have known to think to to invite us. And so it maybe wouldn't have happened or wouldn't have happened that way. And so the talking about it is a part that is one of the many that people don't understand about manifestation is that you have to be detached from how it's going to happen and just be open to all the ways that life is showing up for you. Oh, that story is brilliant. I love it so much. Like that's my dream is to take Everett to like see all these things and like witness it from his point of view and his eyes for the first time (laughs) and all the different places. Like the ocean is the first place I want to take him. Like, I can't wait for that day. Put his little toes in the sand. Oh, it's, so <laughs> it's so much fun. And it's so cool to see which each one of us were like amazed by, because it wasn't always the same thing. And so it was so fun to see like <laughs> me kicking out about something. And then we went to the salt, salt flats and my husband lost his damn mind. He was so excited about being at the salt flats and all three of us, the kids and I were like, what is happening? But it was <laughs> contagious, right? Like it was so contagious to be around somebody who was so excited about something that I would have never guessed. And so yeah. we, we just fed off of each other like that, the entire trip, the teamwork that we developed together. I mean, it was just, it was so incredible. I could not have dreamed of a better experience for the four of us. Oh, that is so good. So if you had to say the biggest takeaway that you had from that trip. I know you've told us most of it, but I would love to hear from your own words. Like what was your biggest takeaway from that trip? So I think from, from me personally, it was that I am capable of more than I thought I was having a chronic, having chronic health issues. I think I doubted my body 
a little bit more than was necessary. So that was really, that was a really cool thing to take away from that. But as a family, I think I realized we had become more resilient than I had given us credit for. And looking back, I can see that when the pandemic started, my husband and I doubled down on our support with the kids, the, the emotional processing that needed to happen, our own emotional healing and well-being. Mm -hmm. And we became, we answered that question. We became the people who needed, we needed to become individually and as a family to be able to have the experience that we wanted. It was a moment of like, oh, it really works. Like, oh, this really does work. The thing I've been saying for a long time, not just works in small ways, but works in big ways as Mm -hmm. well. And so it just gives you, once you realize you can create that experience for yourself, you think, oh, and then I can create any experience I want for myself. And to be able to teach my kids that at 12 and 15, if I had had that clarity at that age, I can't imagine what I would have been able to do for myself that would have landed me in in a healthier body, but also more joy more often. Mm -hmm. And they are getting to know that they they will only know that that's how to live from now on, like that, that you can do that. And it's that, I think if nothing else was taken from the trip, being able to see that my kids could manifest the life that they want for themselves, Mm -hmm. they are in control. They have that power. I mean, there's just, there's nothing better than that. Oh, that gave me goose pimples because that is what my mom and dad did for us. And literally thinking about it could make me cry. My dad dreamt of bringing his whole family to America. My mom dreamt of having running water in the house. Like, and they made that happen. They brought four kids over to America without knowing a word of English, just by the fact they believed that it was possible. And they went on that journey, not knowing a soul, not knowing a thing. And no matter what me and my family have gone through, that has been the thing that is always, always going to hold us together is that my parents did that for us. We hear these stories and they will never get old hearing that story. And then, yeah, now there's five of us. My little brother was born here, but I just like, Sometimes I think about that and I was like, would I have gotten on a plane, not knowing where I was going, not knowing a word of English, like with four kids in tow, being young. Wow. It's a lot of trust in yourself and the universe, right? I mean, it's incredible. And and that's now genetically embedded in you and in your son. Like you're going to be able to hand off that story, those stories to him. (laughs) And he is going to be able to say, oh, that's in me. I don't have to work or try to fix anything. That's already in me. So now I just need to access it. I never looked at it that way. Wow. I've never looked at it that way. That is just in me because everybody (laughs) is always says like, Josie, like your life is magical. And because I do, I'm very aware that my thoughts create my reality. Yeah. So when I was growing up and saying, fake it till you make it, it wasn't all bad because it was what I needed at the time. Right. And so even though it probably wasn't the healthiest way to foster the feelings I was going through, it's what I needed at the time. But even then I was always constant of like, my thoughts do create my reality. I don't really know how, but it does. And so being the observer of your thoughts and of the observer of what you allow in your thoughts, it's what it keeps coming back to. Yep. And And you are wired, you genetically have these super strong, resilient factors. And there's evidence to prove science-wise, research-wise now that, that backs this idea up of genetically, we alter future generations by our physical experience and Mm -hmm. on, on the, on earth. And so you doing the work that you did before your son got here, handed him a set of genes that Mm -hmm. was even stronger than what you were handed. And ah, I love that. Isn't that incredible? <laughs> yeah. And think about, you know, whatever his future holds, whatever, mm-hmm. if he chooses to have children later on, I mean, how powerful the genes are that he's going to hand off to the next generation. So, you know, knowing that it's not just thoughts, it is, but it's also that they're supported by your physical being can really power up that experience in my experience. Anyway, I have never heard it said that way. And that just like, opened up a whole new little window in my mind. Like, wow, that is so amazing that if you choose to do the work on yourself, you're not just, it's not just for now, but it's like, wow, that gives you like response. Like that makes it so much more like, like you have to do it. Like urgency. Yeah. Like it needs to be done. If not for you, then for the next generation. I mean, that's the ultimate gift, right? To our kids is to hand them something better than what we were handed Mm -hmm. and strength and resilience embedded in your DNA. I mean, 
you can't get more granular than that. Wow. I have never thought of it as embedded in my DNA, but it sure is because my parents, wow. Yep. Wow. Amazing. I love that. Oh, I just give me, I keep getting these goose pimples. So we must be meant to talk, Tasha. Obviously. Because <laughs> I'm just like, wow, you're speaking to my heart and my soul. I would love for you to tell our listeners where they can support you, where they can go celebrate you, what that it is that you're so excited about right now. Thank you. Yeah. So we are on Instagram and a little bit Facebook best place for us is probably Instagram or clubhouse. Actually, I spent a lot of time. We have a huge community on clubhouse, the, the platform of audio platform and it's rules and rebellion, both places or Tasha Skillen and boldly becoming you is on Spotify, audible, Apple music, wherever you listen to podcasts. The thing we're most excited about is, is looking at 2022 Our overall theme going into that calendar year is supporting our community and receiving, being able to receive inspiration, being able to receive healing, be able to receive connection and collaboration, compassionate curiosity, really embodying that in all of our programs and all of our, our systems. So that, because if you can receive, then the path is so much shorter to do all the other things you want. And so we are, we're really doubling down on that focus. And I'm really excited about seeing what's going to be possible when all of us, we're going to continue mm-hmm. doing our work to the, to, mm-hmm. to deepen our receiving, but to see how many more women are going to be able to really see what I see in them Mm. because they're willing to receive what I have been saying and seeing in them. So Mm. that's, that's what I'm most excited about right now. I love that so much. I was journaling the other day. And the question that I was journaling on is how much goodness can you accept? How much good can you hold? And in that meditation, I literally was bawling my eyes out. Like I was in meditation before I journal, I always meditate first and really like get connected to my body to answer the question. And I was just like, this goodness has always been here for me, always will be here for me. And it is here for you It is here for the people listening. If only we'll just allow ourselves even just Mm -hmm. baby steps. So I love that that is your focus and you're going to help so many people. And I want to celebrate you for telling your story today. I want to celebrate you for like giving me all these, like, (laughs) I was like destined to meet you because I just kept getting these goosebumps and this feeling of like total connectedness. So I just want to honor you and thank you for being here and sharing everything you shared with us. Thank you for having me. And thank you for letting me share and glow and geek out about all the things that I was talking about today. It is my mission to collaborate with as many women in particular as possible, because we all need to be doing this work and creating environments and containers where it's safe to be fully expressed. And I'm so glad that we connected it. And I'm I'm so grateful for what we're about to discover together going forward as we look at other ways to collaborate. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Tasha. Thank you so much for listening to the Make Life Fun podcast. I am so filled with joy to have you here. If this show resonates with you, I have a gift for you. If you're feeling stuck, this freebie may be just what you need. I believe that if you know your why, it helps you get unstuck quicker. So to connect with your heart and know your why and figure out what it is that is most important to you, get the freebie. It's in the show notes. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast to get notifications each week. To support the show, you're invited to leave a tip in the tip jar. Information for all this is in the show notes. Sending love and light to the spirit listening to this today. Be blessed.